from the man that had everything that moved, airline, shipping, buses, uh, trucking, he gave me the airlines. Uh, the man that had chemicals and drugs had been given radio, television, motion pictures, and he gave me television, radio, motion pictures so he could keep his chemicals and drugs. Uh, now, I have a talent, and those industries played into my natural talent. I can look at a numbers, and they will light up and tell me a story. Don't ask me to spell, but numbers will tell me a story, and I looked at the motion picture companies, and I realized that they had all of these totally depreciated films that were being carried at nothing. And I said, they should have a value for television. So I wrote a report which recommended the stocks of that industry. And uh, it got quite a following. And I was at Bates and Company, but two years later I was making $130 a week, and the men were making two and a quarter, two and a half, and you know, that's a quality of life difference. So I decided to get another job. I was not successful. I wrote the research partner of every major firm and did not get one answer. The New York Society of Security Analysts sent out my resume, resume with my initials on it. I got an interview and a job. And at the first day I was at Shields and Company, I got a call from Madison Fund, a closed-end fund listed on the New York Stock Exchange. And the trader from the fund called me and said, we made money on a report you wrote, we owe you an order. I was not registered, I couldn't take the order. So I went into the partner in charge of research and I said, Mr. Merkel's assistant called, they owe me an order, shall I wait till I get registered? And he practically shoved me out of the door and said, get the order, we'll make it up to you at Christmas time. So I started to bring in institutions that I met based on my research. Now, at that time, uh, a lot of the younger people from Wall Street used to go down to the Henry Street Settlement House and volunteer. And I used to do that, and I met somebody by the name of Mark Finkel, who was basically my age, and he said, I understand you're not happy. Why don't you come into the firm that my father started? His father had been with Bear Stearns and had owned a, a very large piece of it. So I went into Finkel and Company as a partner. Whoever thought that I would be a partner of a member firm? Well, Mr. Finkel had delivered control of a company called Chicago and Northwest to Ben Heinemann. That's the old railroad. And they wanted to buy another railroad. And I said to him, and Mr. Finkel was a little guy, he was maybe five, six. And I said, Mr. Finkel, one of my clients owns Gulf Mobile in Ohio. He says, go over there, tell them to buy more and vote with us. Well, I went over there. And they said, we voted our stock for sale at a price that's above the market. So I found a buyer and I traded both sides of that stock. Actually, Mr. Finkel traded it. I watched him do it. And I made $20,000 that day. I did not know what $20,000 looked like. 
And Mr. Finkel said to me, how do you know those people? And I said, through the Analyst Society, Mr. Finkel. And he said, you come here and sit next to me, which was the trading table. The first day I was on the trading table, I learned every four-letter word. <laughs> I had to have two languages from that day on. If I was talking to the portfolio manager or analyst, I had to speak like I would speak to you now. If I was trading, if I was doing business handling in order for the trader, every other word had to be a four-letter word or they didn't trust me. <laughs> well, I was a good student and learned fast. The only trouble is every once in a while I get the languages confused. <laughs> but, uh, I started to really do a lot of business there. I learned a lot and I learned how to handle orders and work with the specialists. And I learned another facet of the business and I was one of the few analysts down, down on Wall Street that knew both sides of it. And I was doing very, very, I was doing a lot of business. And I thought to myself, I'm not getting anywhere here. And so I asked Jerry Tsai, the Chinese money manager. I said, Jerry, what large firm can I go to where I'll be paid equally? And he looked at me and he said, don't be ridiculous. You won't. He said, buy a seat, work for yourself. And I said to him, don't you be ridiculous. And, and God bless Jerry Sai, he looked at me and he said, I don't think there's a law against it. And so I took the Constitution of the New York Stock Exchange home I studied it, and I felt I qualified. Now, the, the hardest roadblock that I had was, I went to the exchange, and yes, I was qualified, and they sort of agreed to admit me, but then they changed their mind, and they said, because they said, how are you going to finance it? I said, part cash and part a loan, because I had built up the money at that time. And I said, I'm going to borrow against $400,000 worth of securities, and I'll pay the rest in cash. Uh, the stock has changed, changed their mind. They said they would not accept my bid card unless I had a letter from the bank that said, in the event we accept the bid card from Muriel Siebert, the bank stands ready to make the loan. So I was in this catch-22 because no bank would give me such a letter because they never had to write such a letter before. But I persevered and what I did was I was talking, I used to do a lot of business with Chase Bank and I was talking and they said, well, when are you getting this seat? Because I told them I was going to get by a seat. And I said, I guess it's not going to work because XYZ Bank, I don't want to use the name of it. But I will tell you, I later regulated them. <laughs> and so... The Chase Bank wrote the letter for me, made the loan. I'm told it was controversial enough, so it needed the initials of David Rockefeller on it. And there was a time I saw Mr. Rockefeller, and I had my stock exchange badge in my pocket, and I thanked him for 